This is probably the second time I've seen a bathroom extractor fan with a blown circuit board. I'm not entirely sure why this happens, since both of them weren't mine, but I was interested to find out more about what the circuit is used for and how it got put together. So in this video, let's take a look inside a typical mains powered bathroom extractor fan. Here is a typical mains powered bathroom extractor fan. Taking the front cover off reveals a very simple design. The fan, made of blades connected to a motor, and the remains of what was a small circuit board. There doesn't seem to be much going on with the fan portion, so let's take a closer look at the circuit board. Looking at the connectors, it's clear the mains input side is the side that failed, and quite catastrophically. It's hard to make out the exact components in this state. Luckily, I managed to get my hands on the replacement unit before it was installed. I don't have that unit with me anymore, but I did have it long enough to take some pictures of a fresh new circuit. We have two terminal blocks, a potentiometer, some resistors, some capacitors, some diodes, an IC chip, and a switching device. After taking a closer look at the individual components, I identified them as shown here. The potentiometer had a 605 marking, leading me to believe this was a 6 mega ohm potentiometer. This was a bigger value than I was expecting, but I confirmed it by measuring it with my multimeter, as well as finding out the design of the circuit, which we'll talk about later on. The resistors were easy enough to identify from their colour bands. I had a little bit of difficulty with the blue metal film resistor as it had 5 bands and the last band, which is normally gold or silver, was brown. Having brown as the first and last bands didn't help identify which direction I was meant to be reading this in. It was either 1.5 kilo ohms or 11 mega ohms. 1.5 kilo ohms seemed more reasonable and I confirmed this by measuring it with my multimeter, as well as seeing the circuit design that we'll see later makes more sense. The diodes were also a little tricky to find out, given their small size. I thought all three orange coloured diodes were Zener diodes, but it turns out one of them is an ST4148, which is not a Zener diode, but a standard 4148 diode. I found a tip online to help identify Zener diodes, that is, by taking a 20 volt DC voltage source and connecting it to a diode through a 2 kilo ohm resistor. The resistor limits the current to about 10 milliamps and prevents any damage to the diode. By measuring the voltage across the diode in forward bias, you should see the standard diode voltage drop of roughly 0.7 volts. In reverse bias, the voltage drop should be the Zener voltage. Here, the CU15s were, as suggested by the markings, 15 volt Zener diodes. Seeing the supply voltages, or open circuit, would indicate they are not Zener diodes, and low voltages would indicate faulty diodes. The IC chip is a CD4001B quad 2 input NOR gate. Basically, it's four NOR gates in one package, each with two inputs. The switching component, which I initially thought was a transistor, is actually a MAC97A6 triac which can conduct current in both directions, perfect for switching alternating currents. Now that I knew what the components were, I wanted to find out how they were connected together. I took photos of the front and back of the circuit board, flipped one of the pictures, and carefully traced the tracks to the components. I tried recreating the PCB as accurately as I could on fritzing. I used fritzing here because it has a very good rat's nest feature, which would have made converting from PCB view to schematic view much easier. Here's the resulting PCB layout on fritzing, here's the schematic view, and here it is again on LT Spice, with the layout slightly simplified so we can do some simulations and see electrically what's going on. Note that one of the NOR gates on the IC is unused, so I have not included that in this circuit. The live pin of the load is permanently connected. The neutral pin is switched by the triac, which is controlled by the circuit. We can split the circuit into two parts. First, the supply voltage for the IC. The datasheet for the CD4001B shows that it has a supply voltage of 15 volts. The mains voltage, 
is first current limited through the 22 kilo ohm resistor to a theoretical maximum of 15 milliamps at 240 volts AC here in the UK. This is then halfway rectified through the 1N4001 diode and smoothed by the 47 microfarad capacitor. The 15 volt Zener diode then acts as a regulator to keep the voltage at around 15 volts. Next, we have the timer portion of the circuit. With the switch off or open, there is no current flowing in from the switched live terminal. We just established there is 15 volts DC on the left side of the 15 kilo ohm resistor. We can use this rectified input to feed into the input of the logic gates. The 15 kilo ohm resistor is to further limit any current flow and the second 15 volt Zener diode is to regulate the voltage on the input of the first NOR gate. A quick look at NOR gates. It's a logic gate that carries out the NOT OR logic operation. For a regular OR gate, when either input 1 or input 2 is high, the output will be high. Otherwise, the output will be low. Since this is a NOT OR, the output is inverted, so that the output is low if either input 1 or input 2 is high. I might make a video about this later. Let me know down in the comments if you'd find this helpful. Since both the inputs are connected here, it simply means both inputs will be the same, and the NOR gate is actually being used as a NOT gate, or an inverting gate, where the output will be the opposite of the input. The 15 volt DC voltage on the input of the NOR gate is read as a high, meaning the output will be low, or 0 volts. When the switch is closed, mains voltage is introduced to the 15 volt DC on the input. The negative cycle of the wave subtracts from the 15 volts, pulling the NOR gate input towards 0 volts. This turns the output of the gate high. You can see from the simulation that this only happens on every negative cycle. With the output high, current flows through the diode into the 470 microfarad capacitor, charging it up and increasing its voltage to the maximum of 15 volts DC that the NOR gate can output. The voltage across the capacitor is used as the input to the second NOR gate. This time, the capacitor voltage is used as one input and the neutral line is used as the second, effectively a permanent low. So the switching here is done exclusively by the capacitor voltage. With the capacitor charged up and the voltage high, the output of the second NOR gate is low, which is fed into the third inverting NOR gate and outputting a high. The high voltage and therefore current flow into the triac gate pin turns the triac on and completes the fan circuit by allowing current to flow from the live through the fan and back to neutral. The fan is now on and will remain on as long as the switch is closed. So what about the timer portion? How does the fan stay on after the switch has been turned off? This is where the potentiometer comes in. Since the fan is turned on when the capacitor voltage is high, the duration of the on time can be set by changing how long it takes for the capacitor to discharge. The diode that charged the capacitor will block any reverse current flow back into the first NOR gate, which would damage it, so the capacitor needs to be discharged through the potentiometer. This is a simple RC circuit. The capacitor discharge is modelled by this equation, shown by this graph. I have also shown a rearranged equation to calculate the time it would take for the capacitor to discharge to a certain voltage. The fixed 200 kilo ohm resistor ensures the capacitor will not immediately discharge when the potentiometer is at its lowest setting, potentially zero. This gives a theoretical discharge time of about one minute. That is, the NOR gate will flip its state once the capacitor voltage reaches around seven volts. At its highest setting, the 200 kilo ohm resistor is added to the 600 mega ohms for a total of 6.2 mega ohms, giving a theoretical discharge time of about 30 minutes. I don't have the box with me, but I think the advertised timings for this fan are between 5 minutes to 30 minutes, so these numbers check out. All in all, it's a pretty simple circuit. The same circuit might be used on a lot of extractor fans out there, as it seems to be pretty generic. I'm not sure why this one burnt, maybe some steam got in and condensed on the inside and shorted it out, 
but at least now we know how it works.